Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dearest brothers and sisters, in the early 1400s, the bishops and the religious authorities of the Christian world got together in a beautiful place called London, a very beautiful place called London, and they all got together to debate whether women were human or not. And they came up with the conclusion that no, they were not human. Right. In the year 1746, in France, again, a very enlightened group of Christian clergymen got together in a very beautiful place, in a very, very beautiful place called Paris, in order to debate whether women truly were devils or have we improved in our thought of who they are. So they had a debate for three days, intense debate, pros and cons, pluses and minuses. Who are they? What are they? What's their true nature? <laughs> They're talking about their mothers for God's sakes. They're talking about their mothers and their wives and their daughters and their sisters. What did they conclude? They concluded that mm, they are human, but their souls are lesser than the souls of men. And this was the conclusion of this council of clergymen in the year 1746. And in the year 1700, after the birth of Jesus Christ, a man by the name of Muhammad وسلم, had a very different conclusion. He had said women are not only equal to men, but they can actually be sometimes even better than men. Subhanahu wa It is such a shame that when a Prophet Muhammad وسلم, this blessed man who gave such value to women and removed these misconceptions and these idiocracies that people said about their other half that subhanallah that it is now today that we say that Islam denigrates women. What a irony subhanallah. What a hypocrisy. What a hypocrisy. The West are children of these same bishops from France and of the same, same bishops from, from UK who said these sort of things. And today now we believe that we have liberated women whereas Islam had done that so many years ago. My brothers and my sisters, truly not only did Islam liberate women, but of a surety Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained that in the Quran, He gave women far more credit than we do sometimes. In fact, in a very amazing couple of verses in Surah Al-Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us a very important lesson. He teaches us that a woman can indeed be better than a man. And he says it very clearly. And he says it with a very, very clear example. Let me tell you the story of, of the wife of Imran, alayhi salatu wasalam, the mother of Maryam. وَإِذْ قَالَتِ امْرَأَةُ عِمْرَانَ رَبِّي إِنِّي نَظَرْتُ لَكَ مَا فِي بَطْنِي مُحَرَّرًا فَتَقَبَّلْ مِنِّي إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ O oh my Lord, I have consecrated for you, made sacred for you, what is in my belly, meaning she was pregnant. So she wanted to make whatever was in her belly sacred for the cause of God only. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Indeed, you are the all-hearing and the all-knowing. فَلَمَّا وَضَعَتْهَا قَالَتْ رَبِّي إِنِّي وَضَعْتُهَا أُنْثَى وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا وَضَعَتْ When she delivered the baby, she said, Oh Allah, I have delivered a female child. Oh, oh. Female child, she wasn't expecting that. Whenever someone says, I'm going to keep this child for God, or I'm going to do something special with this child, what do they think? Male? The default is the male, isn't it? The default is the male. But Allah wanted to prove a point. So what was the point? It's coming up very soon. So, فَلَمَّا وَضَعَتْهَا When she gave birth to the baby, قالت, she said what? Oh Allah, إِنِّي وَضَعْتُهَا أُنثَى I have given birth to a female child. Then she says, وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا وَضَعْتُ Only Allah knows 
Oh Allah, why I have given a female child? Wa inni sammaituha Maryama, wa inni u'idhuha bika wa dhurriyataha min ash-shaytani rajim. And I have called her by a blessed name of Maryam. And indeed, I seek protection for her and for her progeny from the accursed shaitan. Then Allah says, فَتَقَبَّلَهَا رَبُّهَا بِقَبُولٍ حَسَنٍ وَأَنْبَتَهَا نَبَاتًا حَسَنًا وَكَفَّلَهَا زَكَرِيَّةً So her Lord, meaning the Lord of this woman, the mother, accepted this offering from her with a beautiful acceptance and gave her a beautiful dwelling and made the Prophet Zakaria responsible over the affairs of Maryam. Every time Zakaria would enter upon Maryam, he would find so much food and wealth with her. Qala, he would say, Ya Maryam, anna laki hadha. Oh Maryam, where in the world is all this from? Qalat, she would say, huwa min indillah, it's from Allah. Don't you know Zakaria? Inna Allah yarzuku man yasha'u bi ghayri hisab. That indeed Allah provides to whoever he wills without any, any measure. Then, then listen to this next verse. For this is the point of my evidence today. And if the only thing you go back with is this next verse, then that will be sufficient. Because God says, Hunalika da'a Zakariya Rabbahu. It is at that point, because of the advice of Maryam, that, she, that, that Zakariya, the Prophet of God, called out to Allah, saying what? Oh Allah, give me a righteous child. Oh Allah, give me a righteous, blessed child. Indeed, inna ka sami'u dua. Verily, you hear all duas. So my friends, this is my point of evidence today. That a woman taught a prophet to have tawakkur on Allah. That a woman taught a prophet to have iman in Allah. That a woman taught a prophet how she is the recipient of so much good and so much khair from Allah. And that was because of her superior level of iman. Superior level of iman that she had. Indeed, she was an exemplary woman. The mother of Isa, Jesus Christ. May Allah have mercy on them both. My brothers and my sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the examples of the women of paradise and makes the parable of the women of paradise to pearls. Have you noticed that? He says, If you were to see the beautiful women of paradise, you would think that they are like concealed pearls. Have you seen concealed pearls? Well, imagine pearls, beautiful mother of pearl, covered in satin, beautiful satin silk clothing, covered up, lightly covered up, and then lightly uncovered. Beautiful covered up pearls. That's how, that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes women of Jannah as. I can see our brother smiling like happiness. <laughs> Akhi, you're lighting up the room. MashaAllah. Beautiful, bright smile, MashaAllah. Happy man. Excellent. Now this is important. You know why it's important? Why? Have you thought of why does God give the example of the women of paradise to that of pearls? Have you thought of that? Well, if you look into history, pearls were the most expensive of all jewelry. Pearls were the most expensive. It's not diamonds. Diamonds are forever. It's a Beers marketing tactic. It's a marketing gimmick. It never used to be diamonds as a woman's best friend. It wasn't. It was always a pearls. It was a woman's and a man's best friend as well. Because pearls used to fund wars with one war, one war, with, with one pearl, I'm sorry, that would fund multiple wars. It was well known that the Romans would use pearls to stud their th thrones. They would use pearls to stud their horses. With a single pearl, they would fund multiple battles into Germania. Multiple battles for years and centuries, years they would fight with just one pearl. And also in that infamous infamous uh, banquet which was thrown by Cleopatra. Have you ever read about that? The banquet, the most expensive banquet in history. What was the most expensive banquet in history? The most expensive banquet in history, you can read it up in, um, what's that again? 
Please believe it or not. No, it's not actually. <laughs> it's in the almanac of the, uh, of the uh, world records, right? You can read it in that. It says the, the world's most expensive banquet was the banquet of Cleopatra for Mark Anthony when Mark Anthony wanted to invade Egypt. So Cleopatra invited Mark Anthony to a, to some supper, for some a, a food, and said, I'm going to give you the most expensive and most amazing banquet. So Mark Anthony rocks up thinking there's going to be like plates of food and all of the sheep of uh, Egypt are going to be slaughtered for him and he's going to have the most expensive thing, right? The amazing guy is going to come and conquer Egypt and these slaves of his are going to offer the best of offering. So what did Cleopatra do? As soon as Mark Anthony walked into her palace, Cleopatra said, no food, nothing. There's nothing there except a goblet of wine. Goblet of wine. Then she took a mother of pearl that she had, right? One mother of pearl, another mother of pearl that she had earrings. Then she dissolved the mother of pearl in one of the wine goblets and she dissolved the other one in the other wine goblet and she gave it to Mark Anthony to drink. And Mark Anthony agreed, this is the most expensive banquet. So you see, pearls was the most expensive thing, the most precious thing any man would die and kill for a pearl. And that's why God gives examples of pearls. Not because anything else, not because they're particularly shiny or pretty. No, because they were counted to be the most expensive of all human jewelry, of any jewelry to mankind. Right, so what's, why, why am I talking about this? Because if the women of Jannah are being resembled to pearls, it means righteous women, because women of Jannah are righteous women, that's how you end up in Jannah, right? Because you're righteous. So righteous women are like pearls, meaning righteous women are as expensive and as precious as pearls. Smile, he smile. It's free, it's charity. Righteous women, are as expensive as pearls. Have you not heard the hadith of Rasulullah The most expensive or the most precious provision that Allah has given anybody in this world is a righteous woman. Have you read the hadith? Right. That's how it all fits in. Does it make sense now? It makes sense. It does because truly righteous women are a blessing for anyone. A blessing for the husband, blessing for the kids, Blessing for the community, blessing for the family, blessing for the society, blessing for the nation, blessing for the world. Because righteous women, subhanAllah, can truly change the world. I know my wife, may Allah preserve her and enter into Jannah with me. But Allah, if she could not do and did not do, or refused to do, politely, what she does for me by looking after my children, and facilitating me to do the da'wah work that I do, and I travel almost, almost 75% um, of my weekends, right, away from home. If she did not do so, subhanAllah, I would not be able to do what I'm doing now. Pure and simple. It is for this reason why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the wife of a mujahid has the reward of a mujahid. Amazing, isn't it? Why should a wife miss out? What, just the man is going to get the reward just because he's fighting? No. He was able to fight and die in the cause of Allah because his wife was patient and looking after his affairs. If his wife wasn't doing so, would his mind be able to do so, sacrifice himself for Allah's cause? Not at all. It is for this reason why the wife of a fighter has the same reward as a fighter. By necessary corollary as well, the wife of a righteous man has the reward of the righteous man as well. In the authentic, in the verses of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُدْخُلُوا أَنْتُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ تُحْبَرُونَ Enter you and your wives into Jannah and be merry and happy in it. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu mentions in the tafsir of this verse, the most number of intercessions that will happen on the day of judgment is that a man will enter Jannah, is that a man will enter Jannah and say, Oh Allah, I am in level 72. My wife's live at 66. Oh Allah, raise her up to me. And so Allah will accept the intercession and raise her up just because of the dua of the, of the husband and because of the righteousness of one of them. In the other way as well is also true. If a wife is at a higher level, then she makes dua to Allah. Oh Allah, I can't spend an eternity without my husband. Raise him up to me. 
so that he also gets raised up to the level of the wife, mashallah. My brothers and my sisters, these are the examples that we have. These, this is truly why righteous women are so important and so precious to us all. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us tremendous examples of exemplary women in history. What better example can I give you than the wife of the greatest enemy of God? Who was he? Pharaoh. Who was she? Asya. The wife of the Pharaoh. Naam. The Prophet sallallahu said four women completed the Iman. Who were they? Asya. Who else? Maryam. Who else? Fatima. And? Khadija radiallahu These four women completed the Iman, perfected the Iman, completely perfected the Iman, meaning they totally believed in Allah and perfected the belief in Allah with their tongues, with their hearts and with their limbs. Their actions were, were perfect. Their hearts and the actions of the heart was perfect and their statement of the tongue was perfect. And it is for this reason why they had completed it. Who were these four women? Well, we spoke about Maryam. What about Asya radiallahu anha? She was the wife of a tyrant. So next time, when one of you thinks that your husband is so bad, or your husband you know, doesn't pray, your husband is not as practicing as you are perhaps, don't think that you are going to be doomed. Take it easy. Take one step back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed that the wife of As of Firaun could have perfected her iman. So you too can perfect your iman too. You too can excel. You too can be saved. And you too can be a very, very righteous person just like she was. What did she do, by the way? She saved the Prophet of God. Did she not? Musa, والسلام, and she was a stepmom for Musa, والسلام, and of course that ended up being a great mercy for all of mankind because Musa saved the children of Israel, Israel from, the, from, the, from the naughty Pharaoh. Also take the example of Khadija radiallahu anha. In the most deepest and the darkest times of Rasulullah this woman was, was his beloved. This woman was his, was his soulmate. This woman was it for him. Subhanallah. He married her and she was patient. He went to the cave of Hira for six months or eight months only to come back to just get some food and then go up again and she was patient he struggled to spread the religion would be out of the home not have enough money to bring back home for food she would be patient and yet on the day when he came back from the cave of Hira thinking that he had gone mad it was, it was she it was Khadija radiallahu anha who said kalla no, Allah will never, will never disgrace you. La yukhzik Allah. Allah will never disgrace you. It was she who did it. Do you know the effect of the actions of Khadija on this man, Muhammad Wasallam? Let, let me demonstrate how deeply and madly this man was in love with this woman. Due to her actions. In one authentic narration in Bukhari, it's narrated that the Prophet Wasallam was asleep. And he, just, this was in Medina when he was asleep and he was in the hut of Aisha anha, asleep at that time. Suddenly, a woman knocked on the door and said, Assalamu alaikum. Said what? Assalamu alaikum. Suddenly, the Prophet woke up in, a, in, in complete shock and bewilderment. Imagine waking up like you're asleep. He had just heard a sound that sounded like Khadija. Why? Because that was Hala, the sister of Khadija, whose voice resembled the voice of Khadija. Subhanallah. So Rasulullah had just heard the voice of Khadija again. And he could not forget that voice. Of all voices, the one that he could never ever make him forget was the voice of his soulmate, Khadija radiallahu anha. Because he could recognize that. He could recognize that forever and he would never ever forget it. So what did he say? Listen to what he said. Oh Allah, ij'al hahala, ya Allah, ij'al hahala. Said what? 
O oh Allah, don't torture me. Make this the voice of Hala, Ya Rabb. Make this Hala, not Khadija. Don't make me hear voices, Ya Allah. Make this the voice of Hala. Amazing. Amazing. We look for love in the worst of places. In the darkest, in the coldest, and the ugliest, and the deepest part of the night. Wrong places. This is love. A love when a man is still in love with a woman many years after she has passed away. Many years after even her family has forgotten about her. This is what you call love. So at that point, Aisha radiallahu anha saw the expression of Rasulullah and what do you think she said? She said, Ya Rasulullah, O Prophet of God, what do you want with a woman who has passed away and her bones have dried up and she's become, become and it's become dust? <laughs> La ilaha illallah. One thing you can't get rid of is jealousy. Right? What do you want with a woman who's passed away, bones become, become dry and it's become dust? What do you want with her? And so, and then she, she said, Whilst Allah has given you something better than her. Who's she talking about? <laughs> right, she's talking about herself, mashallah, so articulate. So, what, <laughs> so what did uh, Rasulullah say? Rasulullah said, No, Wallahi, Allah has not given me better than her. Inna Allah razaqani hubbaha. Indeed, Allah has blessed me with her love. My brothers, my sisters, the challenge on you sisters is to make your husbands fall in love like Khadija made Rasulullah fall in love with her. The challenge for you is to create a husband that loves you long after you pass away. The challenge for you is to create a husband so madly in love that he'll be like Shah Jahan. Who knows Shah Jahan? <laughs> who knows Shah Jahan? No one knows Shah Jahan? Yes. Shah Jahan, the one who built Taj Mahal. Remember that one? Yes. Who knows the story of Shah Jahan? He had this really pretty wife called Mumtaz. And Mumtaz said that, you know, you have to promise me you'll never get married to anyone after me, which he readily promised. And then thereafter, when, uh, when she passed away from childbirth, then thereafter he built a huge palace and he got all the most amazing, um, amazing stones from all the deepest parts of the Ganges and from all different parts of India. And then, did you know about the story? Then after they built that big mausoleum to house the grave of Mumtaz, who had become dust and bones by now, right? To build that mausoleum, he poked their eyes out and he cut their hands off, of all the workers, 2,000 workers it took to build that huge thing. He cut the hands off and he poked the eyes out. Please brothers, don't do that. Okay, but obviously the reason why he did that was because he didn't want anyone to ever build another replica of the Taj Mahal. Okay, and he did that as a dedication to his wife, to his wife Mumtaz. All I'm going to say is Mumtaz. <laughs> Mumtaz means excellent or perfect, right, in Arabic. <laughs> okay. Take the example, my brothers, my, my sisters, of Aisha radiallahu as well. At the age of 18, Rasulullah passed away when she was married to Rasulullah You see, the wives of Rasulullah truly had a difficult time. Because he had a number of wives, right? He had nine wives at one, one stage. And the wives of Rasulullah the Prophet wasallam, traveled in his 10 years in Medina, he spent three years traveling, 36 months he traveled and 19 battles he fought. So he, he fought 19 battles, he traveled 36 months, of that seven years he was in Medina, right? Seven years in Medina. Of that, every single year that he was in Medina, in Ramadan he spent 10 days in Etikaf. Okay, Etikaf basically means secluding yourself in the mosque away from everyone else so that you can remember the day that you'll be alone with your God in the belly of the grave. So he did etikaf for 10 days in Ramadan uh, every single year. In the last year, he stayed with, uh, in etikaf for 20 days in Ramadan. Okay? On top of that, 
In one of the years, he actually stayed away from all of his wives for about one month. If you minus from the seven years that he was with his wives, because everything else he was traveling or whatever, from that you minus all the days he did itikaf, and you minus all the days that he was in back in, in uh, he was uh, that he had stayed away with his wives, and you divide that by the number of wives he had. What's the average number of nights you get? I did the sums and I got an average of 2.18 nights per wife per month. I can see silence. I can actually see silence this time, not just hear it. <laughs> yeah, 2.18 nights. What makes a woman stay with a man when the man can only give her 2.18 nights a month? It takes a woman of tremendous patience. Would you agree? It takes an exemplary woman, a woman of Jannah. And this is why I pray and I make a sincere door to Allah that may Allah forgive our mothers, the wives of Rasulullah and enter them into the highest of Jannah with their Habib, with their beloved Rasulullah for an eternity. Because they sacrificed the most difficult thing to them in order to achieve some greatness and in order to achieve something great for Islam, which they did, subhanAllah. An 18-year-old woman, never to get married after her beloved Rasulullah passed away, was an amazing thing. Aisha radiallahu anha would say, I used to make dua to Allah, oh Allah, let me see my beloved husband in my dreams. So Allah answered my dua and He let me see him every second day in my dream. MashaAllah. And then, she used to say, I couldn't tolerate it sometimes. So I would make more dua to Allah until Allah answered my dua and He let me see Him every single day in my dream. SubhanAllah. You think about it, it takes an exemplary woman, Wallahi, exemplary woman of exemplary patience, exemplary dedication to be how these exemplary women were, SubhanAllah. Truly they were pearls. Truly they were pearls, SubhanAllah. How else? Could Rasulullah do what he did, subhanAllah, if he didn't have examples of these exemplary women that his wives were. Take the example of this beautiful woman by the name of Fatima radiallahu anha, the daughter of Rasulullah One of those who also had perfected her iman or her faith as well, as Rasulullah had said. The Prophet also said that Fatima would be the first to follow him from his family to the hereafter, meaning that she will be the first to pass away. In one amazing, amazing couple of verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah revealed a couple of verses in the Quran which I came across when I was reading the tafsir of, of uh, Ibn al jawzi I, I came across his explanation of a couple of verses of the Quran. And the verses of the Quran go like this. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا إِنَّمَا نَخَافُ مِنْ رَبِّنَا يَوْمًا عَبُوسًا قَمْطَرِيرًا What is this verse saying? This verse mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes people who give charity in the cause of Allah are those who say verily they feed the poor, the orphan and the, the poor, the orphan, and the prisoner of war. The poor, the orphan, and the prisoner of war. By the way, prisoner, prisoner of war was actually a non-Muslim, isn't it? That's why they were prisoners of war. So Allah is actually saying that it's actually good to, be, to give charity to non-Muslims. So next time you actually ask yourself, can I give charity to non-Muslims? Can I feed them? Can I do that? Of course you can. Goodness to all of humanity is what Islam talks about. So يُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامِ They feed out of the love of Allah. يُطْعِمُنَ الطَّعَامَ الْحُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا A poor man, وَيَتِيم, an orphan, وَأَسِيرْ And a POW, prisoner of war. And they say, إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ Verily we feed you for the face of Allah. لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً We do not ask you for any reward in return. وَلَا شُكُرًا Nor even a word of thanks. إِنَّمَا نَخَافُ مِنْ رَبِّنَا يَوْمًا عَبُوسًا قَمْطَرِيرًا Verily we fear a day we do this because we are afraid for ourselves on a day in which the hearts will turn inside out from fear on that day, which is the day of judgment. Right? And these verses, 
by the agreement of all the scholars of Islam was revealed regarding Fatima radiallahu anha. They were revealed regarding who? Fatima radiallahu anha. Why? Because Ali radiallahu anhu, who was the uh, son-in-law of Rasulullah used to carry things on his head and ferry water and ferry things from people's house to other houses and then get some, some wheat and barley for, as payment. He would take the wheat and barley at home, Fatima radiallahu anhu would then use that wheat and barley to actually cook bread with it. So one day Ali did some of that ferrying, came home after a hard days of work in the 55 degrees Celsius heat of Medina, which I'm telling you is far hotter than Malaysia, brought that, that, that barley back home. She made bread with it. She made three loaves of bread, one for her, one for him, and one for Hassan and Hussein. But before the food could be served to Ali and, and Hassan Hussein, a prisoner of war, war walked by. So she looked at him, saw that he'd just been freed and he's hungry. So she gave him a piece of bread. Two more to go. And an orphan passed by. She rubbed her hand over his head, felt sorry, pity, and gave him a piece of bread. Not thinking of anything, not thinking where they're going to eat. And then thereafter, a poor person walked by, and she gave another piece of bread. So the blessed family went to bed hungry that night. The whole family. And so Allah revealed this verse. Do you know what's amazing about this verse? Do you know what's amazing about this verse? Is that thereafter, after these verses, God describes paradise in no less than 15 verses. An extensive description of Jannah, extensive description of paradise. Now, whenever you go to any extensive description of paradise in the Quran, you will find that God talks about the beautiful women of, of Jannah as well, which are the women of the husbands that are created, or the wives created for husbands. God talks about them, except for these places, this part in the Quran. In this extensive description of Jannah, God does not talk about the Hur al Ain or the women of Jannah, the beautiful women of Jannah. Why? Ibn al Jawzi said, Ibn al Jawzi said, amazing. When I read this, like, oh my God, unbelievable. Do you want to hear it? You sure? Keep you in suspense. <laughs> okay. Ibn al Jawzi, may Allah have mercy upon him, said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved the action of Fatima so much and knew her jealousy of other women because she didn't want Ali to take another wife. Knew her jealousy so much so that he revealed verses about Jannah and did not mention the Hurul Ain at all because he did not want want to offend Fatima radiallahu anha. Allahu Akbar. Amazing. These verses were obviously revealed for Fatima, right? Because the good act that she did. He didn't want to offend his slave. Do you want to offend his slave? He knows his slave doesn't like something. He won't even mention in the Quran because of the feeling of offending his slave. Because he was so happy and so amazed with her act. You see righteous women, when they do righteous deeds, then by Allah, not only are they equal to men, they can far exceed men as well. So much so that Allah above the seven heavens can reveal verses recited till the day of judgment in amazement of his slave, in amazement of the actions of a righteous woman by the name of Fatima radiallahu anha. My brothers and sisters, let me give you other examples other than the wives or the family of Rasulullah Sallallahu Take the example of a woman by the name of Ar-Rumaysa. Ar-Rumaysa. And she was the wife of a man of a Sahaba by the name of Abu Talha. Ar-Rumaysa initially was married to a man by the name of Malik, who was a drunkard, he was a non-Muslim, and he died, died in his disbelief. From Malik, Ar-Rumaysa gave birth to two sons, which I'm sure you know their names. Number one is Anas bin Malik, and number two is... It's okay. It's okay. I have five children too. If my wife wasn't looking after them, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> All right. So, subhanAllah, Allah have mercy on our mothers, subhanAllah. Allah have mercy on our mothers. Okay, where was I? Are you paying attention? <laughs> Just kidding. So, Ar-Rumaysa, 
she gave birth to two sons who, who, whose names you all know. Number one was Anas bin Malik and number two was Bara ibn Malik. Anas bin Malik, at the age of four, Ar-Rumaysa, this woman, said that Rasulullah sallallahu needs a servant. Someone to look after his affairs. Not really servant to do this and that, but someone to be with him, operations manager, for, any, for lack of better words, for little things, okay? Or a PA, secretary, if I may use that term. All right, call it a servant, okay? <laughs> Needed a servant to look after his affairs and to help him do this and that, get this and get that. So what did she do? At the age of four, at the tender age of four, at the tender age of four, beginning of four, not even ending of four, at the beginning of four, she went to Rasulullah <laughs> even though she lived about 10, uh, ten uh, houses down the road, she went to the house of Rasulullah Rasul and said, Ya Rasulullah, I would like my son to be your servant and to serve you and to stay with you in your house. So Rasulullah accepted that. Now my question is to you is this, at the age of four is a really tender age. It's an age when you play around with your children. It's an age where my daughter, subhanAllah, Maryam is about three and a half at the moment. So cute, so cute. Ah, oh, you want to bite her cheeks. And then you get afraid that the child security agencies will be called upon you, so you don't bite her cheeks. So you kiss her cheeks. <laughs> so cute, subhanAllah, at that tender age, when they're speaking to you on the Skype and phone, I don't know what she's saying. But <laughs> She's having a deep conversation with me, telling me everything that Aisha's doing and Yusuf's doing. That age, you just want to freeze them at that age. Please, Maryam, don't grow up. Please, we're going to freeze you at that age. Don't grow up anymore. We love you at that age. Anything more and then, anything more and then we unfortunately tend to lose our children or they become older and uh, uninteresting. <laughs> at that age, beautiful. That kiss is like a million dollar kiss, mashallah. And she runs and she hugs her dad and takes the shoe off her, shoes off my, off, off my feet and takes my socks. And then she gets me water. At that age, mom, mom, dad wants water. She runs and she gets water. SubhanAllah, amazing life. So at that tender age of four, which mother would do that? Either one of two types of women would do it. Either someone completely mad or someone completely sane but knows what's right for her kids. And that was Ar-Rumeza. You see, this boy grew up in the house of Rasulullah SAW. So much so that of the descriptions of Rasulullah SAW that we have available to us of how the man Muhammad SAW looked, right? The only ones who described Rasulullah SAW are the little Sahaba that were little at that time. The only descriptions we have are from Anas, and from Abdullah ibn Umar and from a few other Sahaba who were all little, small at that time. Abu Bakr never described Rasulullah. Umar couldn't describe Rasulullah. Why? Because whenever they were in his presence, they lowered their eyes. They were in so much humility and humbleness in his presence that they could not bear to raise their eyesight to look at him. So it was the little ones that looked at him. You know? The little ones would look at him. And so it was Anas who described Rasulullah in great detail. And Anas radiallahu anhu used to say, because he had become blind towards the end of his life. He said, my eyes have become blind, but I can see my beloved Rasulullah in my dreams. So he used to see Rasulullah as well in his dream, even though he had become blind. MashaAllah. Anas, the Prophet servant, little servant, became such a righteous man. And the Prophet made so much dua for this man. Made so much dua that Anas would say, Wallahi, I could not move a single stone except that I found gold underneath it. Right? Meaning that he couldn't do anything so that Allah would give him wealth and provisions. Until when he passed away, he had no less than 126 children. 76 of whom passed away before him. <laughs> Subhanallah. Obviously they weren't all from the same wife. <laughs> okay? Anyway, but the whole point was the man was exceptionally blessed and the man was exceptionally rich. When he passed away, he had three wives. And when he had these three wives, he left money behind for them. And when he calculated the amount of money that he left behind for each of them, it's approximately, approximately after my 
calculations from what money was worth at that time to now, approximately about 36 million US dollars for each one of his wives. And that is, by the way, after you calculate the fact, after you calculate the fact that the children, that the wives get one eighth if there is children. In an inheritance law, the wives get one eighth. And if he has three wives, then that's a third of one eighth. So that's, how much did I say, 56 million? The 36. So 36 million, that's one third of one eighth. Amazing. Masha Allah. The best of this world and the best of the hereafter. Best of this world, the best of this hereafter. Why? Because of this woman who sacrificed her deepest desires in order to please, in order to, to do what is better and righteous and better for her, better for her son. We're not saying that our sister should do that. Sisters, thank you. I don't want your four-year-old kid. I can't raise them. I've got my own kids. Thank you. <laughs> Inshallah. I'm not saying that we should do the same. Well, what I am saying is look at the examples of such a person. And it takes exemplary dedication, exemplary dedication, and tremendous patience to be able to do that, subhanAllah. Especially when your child is living and growing up just 10 blocks down the road, 10 houses down the road, subhanAllah. Take the example of Ar-Rumaysa with Abu Talha. When Abu Talha, when he married Abu, when Rumaysa married Abu Talha, Abu Talha was a disbeliever. So Rumaysa basically told Abu Talha that I would marry you as long as you accept Islam. So Abu Talha accepted Islam and that was her marriage gift, which was Abu Talha's Islam. So they had a happy relationship. This was, of course, after Malik had died, which was the first husband, had passed away after drinking, etc. Many years later, she migrated to Medina and then got married to Abu Talha, right? So her second husband, Abu Talha, was a righteous man. And with, with Abu Maysa, he had one child, one son, one, one and only son, who, who Abu Talha used to love so much. He used to play with this child, he used to love this child, and as like any father. And Abu Talha used to work in the crops and, and, and cultivation. So go out in the morning and come back at night after working for a hard day in cultivating wheat and barley and all those sort of things in Medina. So Abu Talha one day went away to work and Rumaysa was looking after the child and lo and behold the child put something in his mouth, started choking and unfortunately the child passed away. The child passed away at a tender age of one or two years old. The child passed away. So Rumaysa, the mother, was heartbroken. Imagine your child passing away. What would you do? Cry, despair, be in agony, your heart would be tearing inside you, you don't know what to say, your limbs would fail you, your legs would give away, you would, your head would be aching, your heart would be pounding, your mind would think ridiculous things, right? We can imagine all of these things, right? If our child were to pass away, don't you think so? But what did Rumaysa do? Well, she said, it's going to be, she obviously shed tears and she was sad and very, very sad. But then she calmed herself down. This is an authentic narration in Bukhari. She calmed herself down and said, it is time for Maghrib and Abu Talha will be back. And, he, he, and she didn't want Abu Talha to come back to a house of sadness. He wanted, she wanted Abu Talha to come back to a house of happiness. So what did she do? She put the child back into the cot, into the bed, covered the blanket up, with the ch child's head outside, of course, still dead, by the way. Child's dead. But patting the child as if putting the child to sleep. And in walks in Abu Talha. So Abu Talha says, oh, is he asleep? Yes, shh, shh, shh. Don't make noise. So she pats the child and pretends the child is asleep. So Abu Talha says, okay, okay, I won't wake up the child now. Amazing. And this authentic narration, then she went and she cooked food and she put it in front of Abu Talha. And they ate and, they, and, and she, she was happy with him. And after they ate, they went to sleep and Abu Talha wanted to sleep with her. And guess what? She actually slept with him on that night. In the morning, when they woke up for Fajr time, Adhan was given, Abu Talha woke up. First thing he did was, Go to his son, he wants to wake his son up, play with this little apple of his eye. And he goes there and he finds the child cold. Subhanallah. 
the child is dead. Then he turns around and he looks at Rumaysa, did you know this? Rumaysa said what? He said yes, but I didn't want to trouble you because I knew you'd have a hard day and I didn't want you to come back to a house of sadness. <coughs> what? SubhanAllah. You think about this, this is, it's, it's, it's insane. <coughs> it's insane. It's not insanity. This actually, by Allah, is actually how the most sane people were. That they loved each other so much so, they were so exemplary in their mannerism to each other, that they didn't want to even disturb the husband and his feelings. Because yes, eventually the husband will find out that the child has died. But why trouble him now when the poor man's had a very difficult day at work? Why trouble him now? Let him eat. Let him have some food. Let him have a little bit of sleep. And then thereafter he would be sad. Time will come for his sadness. He will find out. He wasn't going to hide it. But look how exemplary this woman was. I used to have a teacher by the name of Abu Yusuf. He was a student of Sheikh Al-Bani who had come to Melbourne, Australia to teach us. Many, many, many years ago. He used to give classes. Whenever he gave classes, he was from Jordan, he would say, oh, how I miss my wife, Sophia. He would speak about his wife, praising his wife like there was no other women in the audience at all. He would say, oh, how I miss my wife, Sophia. And he would tell us, wallahi, he would tell us that every single time he would walk into the house, his wife, Sophia, would run to him, would hug him, would kiss him, take his coat off him, take his bags off him, take his shoes off his feet, wash his feet, put the food on the table, and then take the food in her hand and then feed it. Feed it to him. And he says, oh, I miss my wife Sophia. Subhanallah. May Allah forgive our brother, our Shaykh Abu Yusuf. He passed away on a trip between Melbourne and Sydney in a car accident, subhanallah. Passed away. And he never got to see his wife Sophia. I hope Allah Azawajal joins them up again in Jannah. SubhanAllah. Truly it's exemplary women like this that control a man's heart. When a woman is so exemplary, when a woman is a princess, she will build a prince. If she can't marry one, she will build a prince in her home. And truly my brothers and sisters, truly if she doesn't build a prince in her husband, then she will build a prince in her children. Because such are the exemplary women by Allah. Such are the exemplary women of Islam. Take the example, my friends, of a woman by the name of, uh, what's her name again? The, the sister of Aisha radiallahu anha. What was her name? Asma. Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu anha. Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu anha was a woman who prepared her son for battle. She was a woman who was tough, ready. She wanted to prepare her child for battle. Who was her son? Abdullah bin Zubair. MashaAllah, prepared him for battle. The only one to do tawaf. When Makkah was being pelted with stones, in the pillage of Makkah in the time of, of Yazid, was who? was Ibn Zubair. He was the one who was walking around. He was the one who was doing tawaf. And he made his, her son into this exemplary human being, this fighter in the cause of Allah. And by Allah, this man, Abdullah bin Zubair, came back to, her, to, her, to his mother and said, Oh my mother, do you see this pillage of Makkah going on? What do you order me to do? And the mother, of course, replied, Oh my son, death is better than this living. And she ordered her, 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 her son to go out and fight until he passed away. Because she would rather Muslims live in Izzah and honor, upon honor, than to live a life of disgrace. And she would rather sacrifice her son for this cause, rather than bring disgrace upon, upon Makkah and upon the Muslims in Makkah. My brothers, my sisters, I can give you so many examples. I'm just getting started. I've got literally literally 50 examples here by Allah the women when they're exemplary they truly are exemplary 
the mother of Bukhari. The mother of Bukhari. Bukhari, may Allah have mercy upon him, became blind at the age of 12 and regained his sight at the age of 16. Bukhari said, my mother used to make so much dua for me when I, when I lost him once and this is Bukhari writing in the manaqib of his ummi in, in the story of his mom he wrote that at the age of 16 my mom made so much dua for me for the last four years since I lost my eyesight that she saw a dream where Ibrahim came to her dream and said Allah has returned Ibrahim والسلام, the prophet came to her in her dream and said uh, Allah has returned the eyesight of your son because of your dua for him Al-Bukhari says I memorized more than a million hadith with its chains, right? I memorized more than a million hadith with its chains. 500,000 of them I memorized when I was blind. Which was when? He was blind. What the? How did he memorize when he was blind? When he couldn't read? You see, his mother used to patiently sit and read to him. She read and read and read and read and read until Bukhari memorized it. Subhanallah. Amazing, isn't it? It's when the mother, when the mother does this to the child. Every one of you have a chance to raise Bukharis in your home. Every one of you can. Every one of you loves your children, don't you? You love your children. Every time summer comes, you buy them nice clothes. Every time winter comes, you buy them even better clothes. Then summer comes again. Then you buy them different wardrobe again. Then comes winter. Then again you buy them new clothes. You give them every comfort. You give them every care. But unfortunately, brothers and sisters, the true care that we fail to give them is to, treat, is to, is to raise them to be exemplary human beings for the Akhir. And that is exactly what I hope that you will all be inspired from the stories of these great women to do with your own children. Because truly, don't you see how when Bukhari recites and we say, Rahim Allah, when we say, narrated by Bukhari, we say, may Allah, have, may Allah have mercy on him. Are we not actually giving the reward back to his mom as well? Of course, because it's the mom who made him memorize it. So every time you're actually benefiting from Bukhari, guess what? It's the mom who's getting the reward as well. You see, the Prophet you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نُحْيَ الْمَوْتَ وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا آثَارَهُمْ وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي كِتَابِ مُمِينَ فِي إِمَامِ مُبِينَ This is in Surah Yaseen. What does Allah say? Verily, we are the ones who have created life and death. And we are the ones who will write down what people have done and the effect of their deeds. So, if I'm giving this knowledge to you, then, inshallah, this is going to be, if, it, if I do, do, do it with, with sincerity, this is in my deeds. And if you act upon the knowledge, this is for my deeds as well, because that's from the actions of my deeds. But did you realize this point? That my beloved father, my esteemed father, may Allah enter me and him in Jannah hand in hand. My esteemed father is now getting the same reward whilst he's asleep. What's the time? Yes, whilst he's asleep in Australia. Has a difficult day, had his nice food, inshallah had a nice meal, and now he's asleep. And he's getting the same reward whilst his son is doing that. You know why? Because I am from the effect of his deeds. Ibn Abbas said, the sons of a man, the children of a person, of a man and a woman, the children are from the effect of their deeds. So your children, if they're good, then, then, they're, then what they do will be in your deeds as well. And if they do bad, then that will be from the effect of your deeds as well. So be wary of what you teach your children. And rejoice if you taught them something great. Create them into great leaders. If you cannot be a ruler, well then you, you have a potential of building a ruler who can have tremendous effect on this world. And you, whilst you are in the comfort of your home, can be the recipient of all that reward that your son is doing and all the magnificent thing that he is earning. So build righteous children. Be that woman that rocks the cradle and as a result by default and de facto rules the world. Be that person, my brothers and sisters, my sisters in Islam, be that woman, the one who can truly, by Allah, truly change the world through her effect on her children. Truly change the world by her effect on her children because by Allah you can truly, truly do so much of service to Islam if you were to raise the next generation to be exemplary human beings. Take the example of the mother of Salahuddin Ayyubi, radiallahu anhu. 
Mother of Salahuddin Ayyubi used to lash her son. Lash him. At the age of six years old, at the age of six, he used to send Salahuddin to where? To where the knights would train, the Muslim knights would be training. He would say, go, my son, wake up in the morning, go and clean their stables. Go and prepare their swords where they're fighting and they're training. Watch them train. And he would not, she would not allow him to come back home until the nightfall, watching them how they fought. Watching them what they did at the age of six. Did Salahuddin conquer Jerusalem except by the training of a mother like this? And she was a Kurdish woman. She was a Kurdish woman. And that's why the scholars used to say, the son of the Kurdiya. The son of the Kurdish woman conquered for us Jerusalem. Which is why our brothers and sisters, mashallah, now are still there in, its, in Islam's third holiest place, mashallah. Allahu Akbar. Has it not happened because of dedication of mothers like this? Subhanallah. Because of this? Imam Malik, may Allah have mercy upon him, said by Allah, the greatest reason for me being where I am today is my mother. My mother would wake me up after Fajr. My mother would wake me up before Fajr. Make me, give me a shower, put my turban on in my head, and at Fajr time, send me off to the, to the salah and say, go and study and come back at nightfall. And I would come back at nightfall. She would take my clothes off my body. She would ask me what I learned that day. Then she would prepare food for me and I would eat. And then she would stay awake until I fell asleep. This is the mother of Imam Malik. My brothers and my sisters, my beloved mothers in the audience, what do you want to achieve with your children? Before that, can I ask you a question? What do you want to achieve with your life? What is it that you want to be? Why do you just want to be the wife of this man in the audience? Why not be the, the wife of this man in the audience, but also something exceptional for this ummah? The builder of a nation builder. The raiser of a nation builder. Raise your kids to be nation builders, ummah builders in your home. Raise your husbands to be people that truly help the ummah. For goodness sakes, don't cook for him if he doesn't listen to you. Use your charms. Women have ways, right? My wife has ways over me, which I don't even realize until it works. <laughs> okay? Use your charms, use your tactics, use your energies, use your strength, use your focus, use your dedication, use your passion, use your emotion, use your heart, use your mind. Build your families, build your children, build your husbands, build the community, help the ummah, and become like these exemplary women who are, mashallah. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he said, Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he said, I had 326 teachers. Of them, 86 were women. 86 were women. Ibn Hajar said, I had 1,300 teachers who, narrated, who I narrated hadith from. 1,300 teachers who I narrated hadith from. Of them, 387 were women. Where are the scholars of the women today? Where are the scholars of the women today? Why do we resign? Why do you resign yourself to be less than what you can be? Why would you stop yourself to be less than what you can be? In medical school, when I was in medical school, as a, as a medical student before, at least 60 to 65 percent of the, of the people studying medicine were women. Now the point is, it's generally true, is it not so? Have a look. The number of people actually in, in, in these sort of sciences, actually women outnumber men. Especially in Australia, I don't know whether that's the case here in Malaysia or not, but especially in Australia, they do outnumber. They do outnumber. The number of, of, uh, of students in a class of boys and girls that actually are at the top, more women than men, or more boys than, more sisters, more females than males are actually at the top, right? If this is the case in secular stuff, and in secular studies, why can you not also excel in Islamic studies? Why is it that the ones that are actually sp spreading Islam around the world are males? Whatever happened to females? Where are the Muslim, Muslim female scholars? Where are they? 
Become a female Muslim scholar. I will send my daughters to you. Become a female Muslim scholar and I will listen to your talks too. And you can put your finger in your mouth so it doesn't sound nice. Okay, like Aisha used to do. She used to give talks to thousands of men who would come to listen hadith from her and she would put a finger in her mouth like that. Why? Because she had a very pretty voice. And she didn't want the other men to feel fitna from her. But that didn't, didn't prevent her from actually talking. That didn't prevent her from spreading the knowledge. Spread the knowledge. Right? Become true exemplary women that, mashallah, you're all becoming in your professional lives. Become that in your religious life as well, inshallah. When you do that, you will become like the examples of these, of these men and women that we have seen, inshallah. Right? Let me end... Let me end my brothers and my sisters in Islam by reminding you all that the women who truly excel, women who are exemplary, should never ever feel that they are anything less than men. Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe said. She said what? She said. Okay, anything she says is nice, right? So <laughs> she said, she said, it is imbecilic of women. It is imbecilic. I'm, su I'm surprised she even got that word. It's imbecilic of women to aim to be equal to men. They should aim better. Right. Of all the things she said, I think this made sense to me. Okay, I tell this to my daughters, but I don't say it's Marilyn Monroe because they don't need to know. Okay, yeah, because ultimately women who just want to be equal to men are just aiming too low. Women who want to be better than men, then that is the woman that we want. And these were the exemplary women of the mothers of the believers and these people who completed the Iman. They weren't happy with simply being how their husbands were. No or being like any other person, no, they said, I'm going to beat that man. I'm going to be better than him. I'm going to be more knowledgeable than him. More knowledgeable than him. I'm going to build a better home than him. I'm going to raise a scholar in my home that is better than him. And I'm going to build a leader in my home, a salahuddin in my home that is going to be better than this leader. Right? That's how she says. And you have that ability. You don't have to be that yourself. You can achieve it through your children. And by Allah, you can achieve it whilst you are happy uh, lying in, on your bed asleep by Allah and your child is conquering the earth with his knowledge and his wisdom and his greatness and, and you are the recipient of all that reward whilst you are lying in the belly of the grave Alhamdulillah Brothers and sisters, Zakallah Khair I hope that inshallah you all benefit from this and that you take this example and then you change your lives and you become truly the pearls that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes exemplary women to be Zakallah Khair Any questions? Yes, there is one. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Shabana. MashaAllah, I have to thank you for such an inspiring speech. I am truly inspired. Uh, and inshallah, I will get one of those women mentioned. I have a very uh, short question. Um, it's about of the uh, stories of the prophet wives, based uh, upon the which you uh, talked earlier. I believe that uh, this thing is focused more on the Prophet, uh, his dear body, and their relationships with him as well. For example, Sayyidatina uh, Khadija, uh, she, is the, uh, she is known to be a Prophet, a greatest spiritual, emotional, and material supporter. But uh, she is also known to be a renowned businesswoman who employed the young Prophet at that time and then got married to him. So my question is, yeah, after their marriage, you can see that the details were scarce except for the children she had and the reaction that she had to the Prophet's revelation. So my question is, uh, I would like to know how did uh, Khadija Abdullah once actually manage to become a successful businesswoman given the fact that during the time, uh, many uh, new world girls were actually buried alive. So the fact that Khadija actually became a successful businesswoman, how she actually grew about doing it. Excellent. Zakallah Alhamdulillah, the sister articulated her question quite eloquently, alhamdulillah. Um, and uh, the question is that, uh, and the point that she, that she made is very, very pertinent, is that uh, you can be a, a fantastic uh, you know, believer of Allah Azza wa and complete your iman while still being uh, an exceptional businesswoman as well. 
uh, and the exceptional and, and the exception ex the her exceptional business expertise was shown by the fact that she used to choose the best of people to work with her uh, and of course that's why she actually chose Rasulullah Sallam to actually work for her as well uh, and to manage her affairs as well and that uh, that actually shows a level of business expertise when you can choose the best people to work for you and that you can attract the best of people to 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 do business for you uh, Khadija Radilana had a very helpful family uh, her uncle uh, who was a who was a well-known academic uh, at that time? Um, uh, uh, I've forgotten his name now. If someone can remind me of the name of the uncle of Rasul of uh, Khadija, ha no, no, not Hakim. Uh, Warak ibn Nufail. That's it. Warak ibn Nufail, uh, radiyallahu anhu, uh, was a man who was an exceptional who was an exceptional academic, as well as a, a very uh, different uh, sort of person when it came to women and helping uh, Khadija and, and her sisters excel. Uh, and Warak ibn Nafail was the one that actually Khadija would rely on, would, would ask for support and advice. And it was really the support of a man like Warak ibn Nafail that allowed Khadija anha to actually excel in her business and, and to do what she did. Um, so it was Warak who was also the same man that Khadija took Rasulullah Sassam to and asked Ya Rasulullah, uh, let me tell, ask what your uh, what your cousin, what your nephew has just seen, uh, and Rasul Sam told about Jibril coming down, and this man, this angel, came down and said that. And then uh, Warak ibn Nufail said, "This is Namus. This is the same angel that came to Musa alayhi And then he said, "I wish, ya laytini kuntu jazan. I wish I was a, a young camel, of meaning young body, uh, when your people will throw you out." Uh, and so Rasulullah said, uh, uh, is my people going to throw me out? Yes, your people will throw you out. Ibn Hajjah said this, uh, this uh, narration from Waraq ibn Nufail is an evidence that Waraq was a, was a believer. Uh, and he was one of the first to believe in Rasulullah sallallahu And so uh, Waraq ibn Nufail is in Jannah, inshallah. So Waraq ibn Nufail was one of those guys who actually had a very uh, good upbringing upon Khadija radiallahu anha, which was, what, which was what was responsible for Khadija being able to do what she did. And many of the noble women, it wasn't just Khadija, many of the noble women at that tribe also used to, uh, at that time, also used to deal with uh, in tijara as well, in business and trade. Uh, Khadija radiallahu was not the exception. She was just uh, a number of women. She was part of a number of, of women that actually used to do business at that time. So yes, there were some group of women that were also killed, you're right. But they were not, it wasn't the norm. The norm wasn't that they would kill the baby girls. It was really certain tribes that would excel in that sort of thing. It was the Bedouin Arabs, for example, that used to excel in killing. It wasn't the norm that all, all women would be killed. Rather, it was from certain tribes, the lower, lower levels of society that would then excel in killing um, the, uh, their, their female children. Allah knows best. Rest were very different, alhamdulillah.